Where did the seals lay within the 70th week? And I believe we established that the sixth seal, the final seal in the sequence, pertained to the fourth trumpet, which, according to the graph, is midweek. I know there may be somebody out there who's, who's thinking, well, I don't know that you settled it for me, Steve. I don't know that I understand necessarily that the sixth seal really was the fourth trumpet. Folks, really, if you, if you didn't get it, go back and look at the teaching, but let me reiterate here for you real quick. If you can imagine, and I guess I could imagine, we have a day, and let's say we're going we're gonna to duplicate it. One day was a third. The other one was according, called the Day of Wrath, where everything commenced. Two particular days, two different days, both of these days involve the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay, fine. I wouldn't have any problem if we have an, two different events which involve the sun and the moon and the stars. If we ended there, I'd be okay. I'd probably say, that. I guess that's possible. Sounds kind of unlikely, but it's possible. But it doesn't end there, folks. We now go on to where both of these days that involve the sun and the moon and the stars also involve the entire planet. All the inhabitants of the entire planet. Really? So everyone, both bond and free, is affected on this day and or according to the fourth trumpet, in between the fifth trumpet, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the planet Earth. So we got two days involving the planet now. And ironically, both of these days also include judgment. You're starting to lose me at this point, folks. You are reaching the realm of irrational thinking. And then both of these days involve a ceiling. Bottom line, if you can agree that, that the odds are so improbable that it's not even worth discussing, you now are left with the understanding that the sixth seal occurs midweek. And that's what's important. If you know where the sixth seal is, it is a big deal. And according to the elder, there was a multitude of people that came out just prior to the day of wrath. They came out of tribulation. No, I'm sorry. They came out of great tribulation, according to the elder. And God wiped away all their tears. Now, I know I didn't prove to you that this is the rapture. What I have shown you is a multitude which no man could number that God wiped away all their tears and they were given white robes and they escaped the day of wrath. They weren't appointed to suffer wrath. Now, like I said, I haven't proven to you that this is the rapture, but as long as I established everything else that according to the elder, these seals prior to the six were classified by the elder as great tribulation. If we get that, it's now time to move on. So what are we doing today? Today we're starting midway, halfway through the chapter of Trumpets and Seals, a side-by-side -side comparison. I want to remain focused on the sixth seal. Some of you out there saying, Steve, I thought we we're going to see the side-by-side. -side. You will. Don't, so don't sweat it. At the ending of the chapter, there is a summation. You will see the side-by-side. -side. You'll see the correlation. You'll see how they are all related to each other how each is the result of the former, or how all of it is the result of war. I want us to pay attention to the attributes, the things that are going on, the elements that we see in the sixth seal. Every one of these elements matters. Two chapters from now, or one teaching away, every one of these things is going to matter. So I want you to get a look at it, Remember these things because they are coming up and they are going to matter. There are a couple things in here, though, I do want you to see right now. In the book of Revelation, the first chapter, it says in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, I know some of you are already ahead of me. I know some of you are already getting this. There is no event, in not, not one event, not one occurrence, not one happening in the book of Revelation where you can find any of this criteria anywhere else. There is no place in the book of Revelation to where it says, every eye shall see him, not one. 
Now, if you're thinking the fourth trumpet is the same as the sixth seal, yes. But it doesn't say over in the fourth trumpet that everybody's seeing him. We only know that that's an event pertaining to the entire planet, the inhabitants of the earth. But it doesn't say over there in the fourth trumpet that everybody saw him, did it? And that's the benefit of getting different angles given to us via different items. The seals give us one angle, one point of view, show us things that another item doesn't show us. But they're all beneficial because then you get the trumpets and you see other things that the seals didn't show us. And then you get the vials and we see where they lay and I'm, they lay in the last half of the week and we get other things transpiring that the trumpets or even the seals weren't capable of giving us. Do you get it? We're given different angles, different points of view, different elements show up depending on the item we're looking at, yet discussing the same points in time. That's what's pretty cool. It's like we're being told the story one way. And then we get to find out other things that happened another way to the same story. So even though the, the fourth trumpet and the sixth seal are one and the same, the sixth seal provides us other aspects that we weren't able to get out of the fourth trumpet and vice versa, folks. So in the sixth seal, we see every eye seeing him. Remember it said, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains and said into the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Obviously, everybody on the planet saw God. And look at the next thing. And they also which pierced him. Who are those which pierced him? Would that be the Jewish people? In the sixth seal, 144,000, 12 tribes of Israel were sealed. That's they who also pierced them. And it says, in all kindreds, all folks, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Do you remember what we saw again in the verse I just gave you? Would that qualify as wailing to you? Of course it would. So what do we have? We have something that Jesus put at the very beginning of the book. Criteria in which to look for anywhere in the book of Revelation. And we have one single event called the sixth seal that gives us this criteria, that meets the criteria. In fact, has all elements in the sixth seal in this event. For someone to attempt to separate the sixth seal from this verse, I would, I would say, I don't know what you think you're talking about. And if you think you can find any of these other elements in any other event, then please show me where they exist. So this leaves us, unless we just simply want to ignore the verse that Jesus put out in verse 7, this leaves us with, He comes with clouds. He's coming again. And I'm going to give you something, folks, guys. I'm going to give you a revelation that you haven't seen or heard anywhere else. I've been telling you that this event is nuclear holocaust right i haven't proven it to you yet though i've been dancing around it and i've been giving you different little pieces and little elements that this is nuclear holocaust folks i want you to consider something that i showed in an earlier video i probably should put it up but i can describe it just as easily to you there is only one device on the planet if you if you've seen a nuclear detonation in fact the greater the megaton the greater the effect. When a nuclear bomb goes off and is detonated, you got the plume, you got the cloud, you got the mushroom cloud as it's properly termed. The mushroom cloud, as, it, as the explosion goes off, it goes off into the air and it's thrusting itself into the air extremely fast, very fast. That impact is unlike anything on the planet. And the cloud or the mushroom cloud is rolling over and over and over onto itself, over and over. And the atmosphere above it is literally pushed aside before the cloud even gets to it. That impact is so great. The atmosphere and the layers and layers of atmosphere that are there are being pushed aside with the same effect that the cloud is giving. And that's a rolling effect of the clouds as you see them part before the mushroom cloud even goes through. So you got the different layers of atmosphere before the mushroom cloud even gets there, parting, and you know what they're doing. Listen to the terminology. 
You have the heavens parting as a scroll when it is rolled together. All the clouds, all the precipitation, all the layers of atmosphere are parting before that mushroom cloud ever even gets there. And you have, as you see in the sixth seal, I told you, look here, number three, heaven departs or separates as a scroll when it is rolled together. And there's only one device we have on the planet, only one phenomena capable of creating this effect, and that is a nuclear explosion. Heaven departs as a scroll when it is rolled together. I'm going to give you another revelation. Look back at verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sometimes I get excited. Are we literally thinking Jesus is going to come on a day when precipitation envelops the atmosphere around the planet? Really? Uh, you're gonna, so, so apparently when Jesus comes that day, it's, it's, it's really going to be raining. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll make myself laugh at times when I hear myself rebut certain things. I, let me entertain myself. It's my dime. There are going to be massive amounts of mushroom clouds detonating around the planet. At one time, in one event, simultaneously, this, this planet is going to be experiencing nuclear holocaust. And Jesus is coming with mushroom clouds that are going to be happening simultaneously around the planet. It's not going to be raining around the planet. He's not going to all of a sudden magically bring a bunch of clouds with him. We're all going to be coming on poofs. No, these are mushroom clouds. And heavens are going to be departing and separating as a scroll when it is rolled together. And yes, I'm reading between the lines again because it's not saying nuclear detonations. It's not describing that this is a mushroom cloud. I get it, guys. But herein, I'm going to ask you to give me leeway and understand the revelations and, under, and understand this. There is no other phenomena or device on the, on the planet that is capable of separating the heavens unless Jesus simply wants to do it by himself. But that's not what this event is. This day when he comes is a day of deliverance. Let's continue reading. Guys, you need to be hitting the pause button. I'm not reading through this necessarily. I will read a little bit of this. The sixth seal is the only event contained in the book of Revelation where it said the entire world see God. So what would cause every eye to see him on the day of the resurrection? Now, if you guys just thought the rapture's secret then you're still confusing pre-trib's point of view with what we've been reading. Pre-trib claims every eye shall see him at the ending of the seven-year period, that it's a secret and visible rapture prior to the seven-year period. But does that jive with anything that we've read thus far? For 30 years, folks, I've known the sixth seal and the fourth trumpet were one of the same, the rapture. Convinced the rapture was the same day as his wrath. Yet when I learned the day of his wrath was also nuclear holocaust, it finally made perfect sense as to why everyone on the planet would notice the event. Guys, if nukes are going off, everybody is going to be seeing it. Now, I'm about to give you a controversial passage. People try to explain this away. I'm not even going to debate it. I want you to read something. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. I want you to listen to what Peter is describing. And you be your own judge. Listen to what it says. This is Peter, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, now I know what we've been told, folks, just listen. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Did you hear what I said there? There's only one day in God's word that is attributed to a thief in the night or a day and or event coming as a thief in the night. And you all know it just as well as I do. It's the resurrection. As I'm going to continue reading, we'll address those verses later. However, if the day of the Lord... Hear <laughs> this, guys. However, if the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, then the day of the Lord must also, must by necessity, be the resurrection. Listen to what Peter describes as this day, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Would a great noise sound anything like nuclear explosions? 
and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. A thermonuclear detonation melts anything in its path, including skin down to the bones. The earth also and the works thereof shall be burned up. Are you guys hearing this? <laughs> this is the day that's going to come as a thief in the night. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for, here, here's, now get this, guys. Listen to what Peter says. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Did you hear that? Peter said they were looking for and even hasting unto the coming of the day of God, which according to Peter, the heavens will be on fire and the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. Are you guys getting this? Why on earth is Peter preaching we're supposed to be looking for a day that looks anything like this? Is the guy crazy? I mean it, guys. What's he thinking? Unless... Plenty have said that the day of the Lord is at the ending of the seven years, and that it's also called the day of wrath. Yet Peter also called the day of the Lord the day of God. So far he's given this day two different titles. Peter also said that this day will come as a thief in the night, of which they were supposed to be looking for, and even hasting unto, a day in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. While some have suggested Peter is discussing multiple days, I believe that assumption completely inaccurate. No, this is simply one day. The day of the Lord, the day of God, the wrath of the Lamb, the resurrection, the rapture, a thief in the night, and nuclear holocausts, all one event. Now that's probably the most controversial passage we'll be discussing. You should be thankful for that. However, what do you think? Why do we have to have everybody else interpret for us what's in our face? I mean it, guys. Why does somebody have to interpret for me what I just read and I have a brain to comprehend? Now, back to this. See why scriptures appear to point nuclear holocaust is this day ready for another nice tidbit? Ever wonder why there's a rapture? And I already kind of hinted toward this. Why does God, in the twinkling of an eye, pull his saints out of the earth? Into the heavens, even. Guys, if he didn't, we'd be experiencing an act of wrath. Actually, the rapture is more of deliverance than it is of anything else, and that's completely characteristic of God. Now, here is a summation of Revelation chapter 6 in its entirety. I want you to remember these. Again, seals 1 through 5, not a big deal. They will become a big deal next teaching. But what is of critical importance, again, a part of the next teaching, is all these elements a part of the sixth seal. They all matter. Now, here's our side-by-side -side comparison. I want you guys to see this. Here is the trumpets and seals correlation. The white horse, it has no trumpet, as I described in the beginning of the chapter, but I didn't give it to you. But it doesn't. It falls down literally in the half hour of silence. The red horse causes the earth to be burnt. It is because peace has been taken from the earth that all of these other things, the seals and the trumpets, occur and follow and are the result of. There is no trumpet pertaining to the martyr's prayer, which is in heaven, that tells us to be aware of the sixth seal that's about to happen. As you can see, they tie the sixth seal ties in with the fourth trumpet. Again, this is how they overlay, basically, in the last half, the wrath of God. It should now be apparent why Revelation chapter 4 verses 4 through 6 stated, There are only two resurrections. The first resurrection contained believers who experienced circumstances pertaining only to the seven year period. While the second resurrection occurs a thousand years later, the resurrection of the dead. Further, after the middle of the week, during the wrath of God, no one else repents of their sins. No one else gets saved. All hope was gone. They'd rather have boulders and mountains fall on top of them than face God. Thus, since no one else repents after the day of wrath, only one other resurrection is required, and that is of the dead a thousand years later. No resurrection of Christians at the end of the seven years, no resurrection at the beginning, just one in the middle after which no one else gets saved. 
Now, I realize some of you think, I don't know that you've settled anything yet. You've, you're, you know what I have settled here, guys? The seventh verse in chapter 1, there is only one event in the book of Revelation that not only contains one piece of criteria of the seventh verse, but all three pieces. And the craziest thing of it all, you can't find any pieces of the criteria in the seventh verse anywhere else in the book of Revelation. Not one place. Jesus said, this is when he comes. Now, if somebody can show me anywhere else in the book of Revelation that any pieces of this criteria is met in any other event, I'm all ears. Let me show you here. We're going to do the next chapter. This is chapter 5, called The Last Day. Matthew 24 has been interpreted by pre and post as Jesus describing the entire seven-year period. That assumption is not only inaccurate, but I believe I can prove it impossible. We're going to see in the next chapter, the next teaching, Matthew 24 is an absolute mirror of Revelation chapter 6. Now I'm kind of jumping ahead, and I hate it when I do that, guys. That's a problem you get when you have, when you have the, the, the author of the book also narrating. Sometimes he gives you the punchline before you heard the joke. <laughs> that's, that's not probably the right thing to do all the time. And that's sometimes what I find myself doing with you guys. Now, let's continue on with this chapter. This is what we are fed. Jesus does teach up to the point of the rapture, or rather the first half of the seven-year period, but not the entire seven-year period. We'll start off by addressing certain controversies surrounding the chapter. Here's how the majority pre and post interpret Matthew 24. This is unscriptural. There are plenty of scriptures, and just take a look. You can read these if you want. Again, you got a pause button, guys. Don't forget to use it. I'm not reading this. There are these scriptures and a whole lot more that tell us we are already living in tribulation. We already are appointed to suffer tribulation. We will go through tribulation. And yet, for some reason, apparently when we enter the 70th week, we're still going to be in tribulation. Nothing changes, I guess. But is that what scripture says? That's all that matters. Not what people think, folks, but what Scripture says. This is mainstream's interpretation of the dispensations, yet Scripture clearly teaches we're already living in tribulation. Wouldn't it be simple common sense? Once the seven years begin, maybe we would classify that as great tribulation? They went from tribulation into great tribulation. And that's the way the graph has it laid out. Now, here are some arguments that I pose to post and to pre. If I show you that Matthew 24 is a mirror to Revelation 6, the argument is over. Now, here's the big lie I want to confront. We are told that this question pertaining to Matthew 24 given from the disciples to Jesus, that the disciples are asking a two-part question. I know you've had to have heard this. And I could sit and rail on this forever, guys. But did you know that's absolutely unscriptural? Unscriptural! It's been said that this is simply a two-part question. That the disciples are asking, What shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world, as if these are two different, unrelated events. This is presumption. And it is impossible. Listen to this. Did you know we're able to study what the disciples learned exactly as Jesus taught it to them? That's why we have the Gospels. They provide the story of Jesus exactly as it unfolded. Each includes information about his life, his teachings, whether spoken openly or even behind closed doors. Think about it, guys. These are the disciples. They wrote the four Gospels. They were there. Perhaps all of them forgot to mention the time wherein Jesus specified that his return to earth would be a separate event, different from the end of the world. Really? Guys, if we're unable to locate anywhere within the Gospels, Jesus teaching his disciples that his coming would be a separate event than that from the end of the world, then it's completely unreasonable to suggest that his disciples were somehow under the impression prior to their query here. Now listen to me. Since it is impossible to inquire about something you know nothing of, how could they have done so here? If Jesus never taught the disciples that his return to earth would occur at a different point in time than the end of the world, then how can any preacher... How can any preacher claim that's the questions the disciples are asking him here? 
You're suggesting the impossible. But it gets better. Prior to this on the mount, the disciples knew only one thing for certain. This is scripture, guys. Jesus was going away, but would return to get them at the end of time. Did you hear me? At the end of time. That's what Jesus taught. That's what we learn. Exactly as Jesus taught it. In John chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, I'm going to kind of skim through this, but I want you to see what Jesus said. Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, and whither I go ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, we don't know where you're going, and we don't even know the way. Did you get this, guys? These rocket scientists, these seminary professors? So close to his resurrection, these guys were still clueless. They were clueless that he was going to die and resurrect and then come back and get them. They didn't even get it. And it frustrated Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you had known me, you would have known the Father also. And from henceforth ye know him. And I've seen him, and Philip now speaks up and says, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient. Jesus actually is frustrated. I've been so long a time with you guys, and you guys are still as clueless as you are. You really don't even get it yet. And you know what? They didn't. They didn't get it. All this time with them, and they still couldn't grasp the simple fact that he must go away and would come again. Are we to believe these scholars who couldn't even grasp a simple fact that Jesus would die and then rise again, miraculously somehow gain some special insight to his death and resurrection prior to their query here in Matthew 24, verse 3. If so, when did that occur? Where can we read this? Why can't we find this recorded anywhere in the Gospels or in the Epistles even? Somebody please explain this to me. According to the Gospels, all Jesus had taught the disciples prior to this was that he was going to go away. However, where he would be, there they'd also be when he returned. So the disciples inquired, Will there be any signs preceding your coming and the end of the world? Again, without any conjecture, we're told the disciples believed his return was the end of the world. Did you hear what I said? The disciples believed Jesus' return was the end of the world. So you just said, Steve, are you saying his coming is the resurrection? According to Jesus, it is. His coming is the rapture. Didn't he just say in verse 3, chapter 14 of John, And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. That's the rapture. That's the resurrection. Now here are the scriptures that I want you to take a look at. These are all rapture scriptures, resurrection rapture scriptures. Other people believe these scriptures pertain to the rapture and the resurrection. And what Jesus says, and what these epistles say, and what we're reading here, when the resurrection and the rapture happens, it's labeled as his coming. I'll also give you the scripture that, again, I end with this scripture in Peter, which is the controversial one. I already told you. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? attempting to persuade the church to be holy. My point, if Peter isn't discussing the rapture, the return of the Lord, then why on earth are they being told to live holy and look for that day and even to anticipate it? Yet if they miss it that day, doesn't preacher believe in a second chance? In the above verses, there is no hint of a second chance. Remember what Paul said about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.23 but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now, if there's any doubt, guys, listen to this. That's his coming. If there's any doubt that Paul's referring to the rapture resurrection or that this day isn't being interpreted as the end, then consider the very next verse Paul said. Then cometh the end. Did you hear that? Paul says Christ's coming is the end. Read this, guys. This is all about the rapture and the resurrection. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and they shall be changed. That's the rapture. That's the resurrection. No matter how you slice it, the above verses are the resurrection, the rapture. Yet how could Paul say, then cometh the end? Well, what have we been reading? Try to consider the disciples' interpretation of the resurrection, guys. Listen, just listen. To the disciples, was the resurrection the end of the world? What did they perceive as the last day? What did they think? And what did Jesus teach? Take a look at what Martha perceived to be as the last day. In verse 23, Jesus saith unto Martha, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day, the last day, according to Martha's belief, was the resurrection. Why on earth did Martha perceive or believe the last day was the resurrection? Do we know that's what Jesus taught? Yes, we do. Coming from Jesus' own mouth, his own teachings. This is what our Lord and Savior taught, folks. Jesus said he would raise him up at the last day in verse 39 verse 40 and I will raise him up at the last day that guys that folks is the resurrection again verse 44 and I will raise him up at the last day he said it three times in this passage obviously no wonder Martha thought no wonder Jesus the Son of God taught that the resurrection was the last day right? You can't argue it. I mean, well, you can try. I mean, I don't know what you're arguing with. Jesus' own teachings said, this is from his own mouth. This is what he taught everybody, that at the resurrection, Jesus Christ would raise him up. And he labeled this resurrection as the last day. So another dilemma. If Jesus specifically taught the last day was also the resurrection, then how could another seven years exist after the last day? And if Jesus himself taught the last day was the end and the resurrection, they are one and the same, then what day would his disciples perceive to be the end of the world? I know I'm yelling, guys. I'm sorry. I need to tone this down. If the last day according to Jesus, was also the resurrection, then what would his disciples have perceived to be the end of the world? Or let me rephrase. If they perceived the last day to be the same as the end of the world, then in Matthew 24, must be dealing with the events leading up to the last day, the end, the resurrection, one event. Again, that's what Jesus taught. Nothing more. The Gospels prove it. So assume the understanding of the disciples. They were taught by Jesus that the end, the last day, was also the resurrection. When Jesus comes, or the rapture, when he's going to come and get them. Additionally, as we compare Matthew 24 with Revelation chapter 6, we'll attempt to prove or disprove their reflection, that they are identical. Are these chapters identical, aren't they? If they are, then pre and post will find some issues impossible to reconcile against their belief and doctrine. Now that is what we need to deal with. That is what this next teaching is going to be. Guys, I'm telling you now, you don't want to miss the next one. And guys, and when I say watch something, don't think he's, he's making some money. I don't, this channel's not monetized and it never shall be. I want you guys to watch this next teaching above any other teachings I've given you. You're going to see revelations coming up that, that are just as impactful as the graph. Until next time, God bless.